Hello, everybody joining us. Hello, hello, welcome. Welcome to Wednesday morning here in Australia. Such a treat to have you all here with us. My name is Chris Gordon. I am the Programming Manager for Readings. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you all here. And before we get started, I want to acknowledge that today I am standing on the land of the Kulin Nation. This is stolen land. This is not my land. It's a great privilege to live here, but certainly this is Indigenous land. And I want to pay my respects to the elders past, present and future. And wherever you are in the world, it's pretty much guaranteed that you are also standing on stolen land. And I think if we could just take a moment, even though that we're here together on Zoom to acknowledge that this is land that's not been ceded and to pay our deep, deep uh, acknowledgement and gratitude to these people that came before us. So today, what a treat we have. I hope you've got a cup of coffee and there's no shame if there's booze in it. Absolutely no shame. On behalf of Bloomsbury, on behalf of Readings, on behalf of Bloody Zoom, it's so brilliant to be here. Uh, I want to introduce you to Alice Robinson, who has taken over from Clem Ford, who was going to be joining us. But you know what? Life got in the way. And during this pandemic, life gets in the way all the time. So we are flexible and easygoing. And Alice Robinson, who is an extraordinary friend to readings, who in actual fact is a readings winner. Her last book, which I'm just going to show you here, is one of my all-time favourite books. It's up there in the top five books. Uh, that I read last year, including dot, 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 Lisa's book. But here is Alice's book, The Glad Shack, and it won the Readings Prize last year. Dr. Alison Robertson is quite an extraordinary author. She deals with issues of motherhood and guilt and sex, something that we are all, all doing more of. Alice, I'm going to hand over to you. You're going to introduce Lisa. Remember, send your questions through. And what a treat that we all have for you. Over to you. Thank you, Chris. What a beautiful introduction. I'd also like to acknowledge the sovereign owners and traditional custodians of the lands that, from which I'm hosting this event, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. And like Chris, I also pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. And I extend that respect to any First Nations people we have with us here today. As Chris said, my name's Alice Robinson and I'm the author of two novels. And it's with such excitement that I introduce you all to Lisa Tadeo. She's a New York Times bestselling author of the incredible book that we are going to talk about today, Three Women. I don't have a copy of Three Women to hold up though because <laughs> after I read it, I immediately gave it to a man who I thought uh, might benefit from it more than me. And I hope he loan loaned it to all his friends and I recommend it to all my men friends. In fact, um, a couple of men I know put it in their Tinder bios that they had read the book. That, that may be doing a disservice to women everywhere, who knows. Lisa has been the recipient of two Pushcart Prizes for her short fiction, and she's contributed to many publications, including New York Magazine, Elle, Glamour, uh, and many others. And she spent eight years getting to know the three women of her book's title, moving across America numerous times to embed near their homes. So perhaps we could start there, Lisa. I read that you said that to learn about desire, you can't interview. You have to be present emotionally and bodily. And so for anyone who's listening who hasn't read the book, can you introduce us to the three women that you've written about and tell us a bit about finding them and connecting with them? Sure. Um, so first of all, thank you for having me readings and it's lovely to be talking to you, Alice. Um, the three women, so there's the, the first one that I found was um, Lena, who lives in Indiana where you told me that you're from, which is, we can talk more about that because I love Indiana. Um, and Lena, when I met her in a discussion room that I, a discussion group that I created um, inside of a doctor's office, she came in and said that her husband no longer wanted to kiss her on the mouth and that the very sensation offended him. And so right away, I just, you know, fell for that kind of, that passion and pain and, 
um, Lena was about to start seeing a former lover or her ex high school boyfriend that she had always been stratospherically obsessed with. Um, so she was reconnecting with him and they were having this pretty wild um, sex in the back of each other's cars. So that was the first woman. The second woman, Maggie, is a young woman from North Dakota, Fargo, North Dakota. And I was, I was in a, a cowboy cafe in, um, in Medora, North Dakota, and I was reading the local paper. And I read about this story about a young woman who had, ha, had alleged that her high school English teacher, um, ha, with, that she had had an inappropriate relationship with him. And she had taken him to trial and the results, the trial did not go the way I would have thought that the trial should go. And, um, and yeah, so I was reading the paper and I saw that there were these like hundreds of hours of phone calls after 11 p.m. And I was just so struck by that, by the fact that somebody wouldn't see that that was weird and that he was just helping this poor young girl. So I drove to her town the next day and, you know, asked her mom if she would let her meet me. And the third and final woman, Sloan, is a entrepreneur in the Northeast of America and a um, aspirational summer island town. And um, she, I met her, I met her after moving to the town for several other people that I was talking to for the book. And as people were saying to me, you know, oh, if you're writing a book about sex and desire, you need to talk to Sloan. And they said that there were two rumors about her. And the first one was that her husband liked to watch her have sex with other people in front of him. And the second rumor that was almost delivered with more sort of like alacrity than, than the, the threesome rumor was that her husband liked to have sex with her every day. And not only did she allow it, but she enjoyed it. And it was like shock and horror that anyway, so with Sloan and indeed with all three of them, I, I started to see how, how much the sort of judgment of the communities was, it was almost as interesting to me as the women's stories themselves because it told a larger story about judgment in America. Mm -hmm. That's um, really interesting and I want to get back to that uh, relationship between the women and their desire and the way that's perceived in the broader world but um, before we go there I'm curious to know, like it seems to me that some of the things that you write about, indeed the whole book maybe, it sort of goes beyond the scope of even friendship, like what we might tell our girlfriends. Um, certainly, you know, the, the specificity of the details around their sex lives, um, yeah, really goes beyond what I would be, you know, chatting about my girl, with my girlfriends in a bar about. So how did you develop that level of trust beyond friendship or in a different category altogether to friendship with these women? What, what, how do you go about doing that? It was fairly organic. Um, I don't, I didn't really try to do anything. I think that if I had tried, it wouldn't have worked. Um, I, I mean, for starters, I've always been incredibly, I'm curious as, you know, most writers are. Um, and what I do with everyone that I know, specifically when it comes to sex and desire, because I'm like endlessly um, intrigued, but uh, I would say like, for example, one of my friends, said that, you know, some, a mutual friend of ours, husband, um, cheated on her. And I said, oh my God, with who? And she's like, the secretary. And I was like, well, okay, but how did it happen? Like, and she's like, I don't know, like in the office, I'm like, but what, like, what was the first, like, I'm just interested in like the first kernel of when something's going to happen. So when it came to Maggie, for example, I would say, you know, what color was the shirt you were wearing? And with Maggie, she remembered everything. She had diaries. Um, with Lena, everything was happening in real time. And so it was just really a matter of like asking the same question like 50 times from like slightly different angles. And um, yeah, I mean, just, uh, just being completely engaged and listening and being interested in every detail. I think very few people, our friends are not interested in every detail. So if someone is like, you know, you'll know it. If someone starts going like, well, and then how did you feel? And then what did you feel that second? You'd be like, oh my God, let me tell you. You know, it's like when someone really cares, you really want to tell it. And is there almost some kind of compulsion or some like fantastic sense of being known when you're invited to share on that level? Of course, there potentially is a sense of exposure too. And it would be interesting to know how you navigated that with the women. 
um, but also a sense of delight in being asked to to be revealed in that way. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a double-edged sword, you know, and I think that, you know, I think that, um, yeah, the exposure, you know, I didn't know what the book was going to be. I didn't know if it was going to be three women or 10,000 people or, you know, six men and what, like, one dog. I had no idea what it was going to be, so um, I didn't really... I, I just, I managed people's expectations by saying I had no idea what I was doing and I would let, keep them abreast at every point in the process and that they could, you know, sort of drop out at any point that they wanted, which is something that people did often after six months and more of talking. So, um, yeah, I mean, it was hard, but, you know. It's interesting that you say that, that people dropped out along the way because as a fiction writer, that's something that can also happen. And I know you write fiction as well. You can spend a long time with characters and then they disappear. So mm -hmm. in that sense, it's not that dissimilar. I was thinking about this thing. I don't know if you know, one of my favorite writers is this writer called Rachel Cusk. And she mm -hmm. has this thing about um, when you write about yourself and people don't like what you've written, they can kind of say, oh, well, that's just your experience. Like it's a singular experience and it doesn't pertain to me. It's not universal. And I was thinking about that with your book and I was wondering um, to what extent you kind of feel that this book is about those specific three women at, or like how much can we infer about women generally? Or is it, is it a universal experience or is it specific to them? I think that, you know, I think that, um, that we all, what the three women shared and what every woman and man that I spoke to shared was the desire to be seen and loved for who they were and not for who they were pretending to be. And, you know, the window dressings change and it can be a man or a woman or a transgendered man or, you know, just on and on. It, it doesn't matter. Um, I mean, it matters. The window dressings matter. It changes your, it changes everything and how you walk through the world. And, but that feeling inside doesn't change. And so, and, and nor does the judgment from the outside change. It might change based on who you are, but the feeling of being judged for being who you are is, is that, that same, you know, difficulty. So I would say that it's, um, it's universal in that. And it's, you know, it's, yeah, I mean, the feeling, I, I would hope people could see a piece of themselves in one, two, or all three of the women the way that I did. I think that thing that you're saying about um, them wanting to be seen for who they are, like that they share this common kind of through line of wanting to be known in some way. Um, one of the things that really leapt out to me about the book was this sense that all three women were kind of bonded to a narrative and they were different narratives about kind of what a woman should be or be like or what a woman's life should be like. And, you know, Maggie's got this kind of formative thing around tw the twilight narrative, you know, that romance. And Lena's kind of goes really far into domesticity and that kind of almost white picket fence kind of marriage-like situation. And Sloane... Um, has a kind of a perfect life in some ways, but then their desire comes along to disrupt that in some ways. Like, can desire and these established cultural narratives about women's lives kind of go together ever, do you feel? I mean, <laughs> I think it's hard. I think that, um, I think that it's really hard uh, and something I've, I've felt and said a few times, and I, I really feel that since the Me Too movement, which has been huge and, and vital, um, has brought with it an inverse and unfortunate corollary, which is that I think women are ever more afraid to talk to other women about their own desire. And I think the reason for that is like, we sort of, we're like, okay, men cannot harass us in the workplace. They cannot say X, Y, Z. Um, but then what if one of us, like Lena, for example, is obsessed with a man who does do those things or, you know, who would do them to her if she allowed him, who wants, in fact, him to do those things to her. Uh, she can't tell people that she likes him, not now, because it's not okay. And, and that's terrible, I think, because it makes women go back into that sort of hole of not being, not wanting to, to speak up. And, um... 
And, and so, yeah, so I, do I think that they can go together? Yes, I do. I think anything's possible. You know, I just, I think we probably need a little bit more time. Hmm. Um, something um, about their kind of relationships to men that are kind of a little bit destructive or take something from them as much as it's giving, or it's a complicated relationship, but they, and that's really interesting to me, but it's also interesting to me, and it speaks to what you're saying about the way their communities respond, um, that, that, that all of these three women have really complicated relationships with other women, or they, they don't, they're um, repelled a little bit by the other women in their lives, or the other women, the, their relationships with men actually kind of expel them from um, the kind of the group of women that they might have been otherwise supported by. And so can you talk, talk a little bit th about that, about their relationships to other women and whether m women can have these desirous kind of entanglements with men and retain the allegiance of other women? I think, it, I think it's really hard when a woman, let's say a woman's kind of unhappily married and her best friend has just started sleeping with this, you know, this, has just kind of like, I don't know, um, is kind of living a high school life, sort of somewhat like the one Lena is living, this like rosy, sexy, um, awesome new relationship. And I think it's hard for the woman who's perhaps unhappily married to be happy for her. Um, it's just, it's a difficult thing unless you're sort of, it, I'm not saying it doesn't happen, obviously, it's just difficult. And I think, I think one of the most difficult things is to, um, is to feel like, it, it, it's to feel like a woman can't, um, can't express herself to, to her friends because it, if it's happiness, because they won't want to hear it. And I always think about that, that part in Seinfeld. Um, do you, I mean, I don't know, is Seinfeld at all bait in, in the U.S.? Okay. So, um, <laughs> so uh, George uh, says to Jerry, you know, I don't want to hear about your happy relationship. Come back and talk to me when it's terrible. And I think that's a very, you know, it, it's, a, it's a thing. It's true. And I think that for women, it's really hard to be totally happy for one another if we're in a low place. And I think, I think, and not to get all sort of, you know, um, scientific about it, but, uh, you know, I spent a lot of time at the Kinsey Institute. And one of the things that I thought was really interesting was that you know, the biology of it is so, it, it's really weighted in favor of men. Um, and, and I mean, socio, socio, sociologically now, we kind of are living under that, that biological hangover of, you know, there's only a certain amount of men in the world and women need to have babies. So I think that, that we are sort of ruled by that biology and it's hard to shake it off when we're, you know, when we like, are like, okay, well, we're, you know, we're socialized human beings and we, you know, we are X, Y, Z. So I think, I think that's part of it. Um, so I think it's just harder, but I, I think we're getting there. Hmm. And you're sort of speaking a little bit about the ways in which also women are in competition with one another. For men. Yeah. We've got a, got a question, Lisa, from Kate Mildenhall, who's a wonderful Australian author as well. And she said, Lisa, how have you dealt with the prolific success of three women? Has it changed your relationship to your writing? That's a great question. That's a good question. Um, you know, I, I don't know. I still, yes, it's been it's been great. It's been, it's, it's shocking. I didn't think that people were going to read the book. Um, at all, really. I mean, I didn't know what to expect. I certainly didn't expect a lot of people to read it. So it, it has been, it's been great. I also have an intense amount of anxiety. <laughs> so, um, so for me, like, I really prefer to just be in one place writing. So, um, and I don't like to travel. I don't like to, although I was supposed to come to Australia and New Zealand, and I was really excited about that. And that was the, you know, it was right before. And I'm so sad because that's the one trip that, um, that I'd been, I'd been wanting to go to Australia my whole life anyway, soon. Um, but in, in terms of what it did to my writing, that's really interesting because 
I haven't been able to do the kind of writing that I've wanted to do because I've had to do other writing. Um, and some of it's been really exciting and like TV stuff and, and it's been great, but you know, my heart really lies in just writing by myself alone. So it's, it's really been, it's been not good for that. And that's the reason I got into this. So it, it's kind of a catch 22. We've got another question. Megan's asking, she says, I'm curious about the stories of the women who stopped with the project before the book was written and whether you can comment on how the book would have been different if those stories were included. It's a really good question. Um, I, I don't know, you know, uh, there were several people, the first draft of the book was, the first real draft was about 15 or so people. Um, and I didn't know if they would all be in or not. I just had them, I had them fully written. Um, but then one of the people didn't want to be in it anymore, period. And that was the person that would have definitely been in it, like who I'd found between, um, between Maggie and Sloan. And I'd known her for a lot of the time. So that was very difficult. And then the rest of the people who were not as, as sort of, it wasn't even about people not being exciting or interesting. It was that they didn't give me as much. So if you look at like Lena and Maggie and then Sloan, and Sloan gave me the least in terms of word counts and access. So, you know, and, and Lena probably gave me the most, which is why you'll see the way it's kind of like, you know, weighted heavily in that, in that direction. So uh, the book, you know, if it had been, let's say 14 people, um, it would have been these three women's stories really big. And then these other stories, like, you know, small little sort of, and that was a book that, I don't know, it was a book that I didn't really like the looks of. It, it felt a little, you know, it's like you kept everyone who had read it, so they just wanted to get back to those women's stories. So it felt natural. Um, I don't know what kind of a book, I don't, I don't think it would have been as good as, of a book. I was, this is maybe a bit of a craft question, and Philip has asked one that's a little bit similar. But I'm, I was thinking when I was reading the book as a writer, it oscillates between the three perspectives or between the three stories. Were you really attuned to um, how one flowed into, or the resonances that kind of came from those different stories rubbing up against it, one another? Like, so when, you're, when you were sort of passing each chapter, were you thinking about the, the moment that you left the reader in one and then moved on to the other? How did you make those distinctions between the little segments? It was really, um, it was, you know, it was, it, it was kind of, um, it changed a lot. Each uh, section of each woman's stories was like on an index card and then like on a giant board. And I did a lot of moving around. Um, you know, sometimes at a certain point I was like, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It can be any order. And then I'd be like, no, this order is terrible. So it, it was just, it was a fluid thing. Um, I like to think, I, I didn't ha I don't think in the end that I had much to do with it. I feel like it was kind of organic. And by organic, I mean like, okay, this is the one we're going with now. Like I'm not doing it again. <laughs> um, but yeah. A lot of other books waiting that could have been the book. Uh, yeah. <laughs> or, 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 Philip, I wanted to know, um, how did you know when it was time to conclude their stories? Yeah, um, you know, uh, my editor from Esquire said to me, like, you know, on like year seven, and he knew that it was supposed to be a two year contract on the book. He was like, you know, at a certain point, you just have to stop reporting. And I was like, yeah, you know, and everyone thought it was kind of like, you know, obviously, they thought it was going on for too long. But um, I, I knew, you know, I never knew I could have gone on talking to all three of them forever about their stories. I had to stop somewhere. Um, I stopped when I felt like, I stopped when I got a couple of last things from each of the women that felt like, like they were like the keys to things that after I talked to them for so long, um, that they had sort of found out some things about themselves. And when it got to that point, I felt good. And I also wanted them to feel good about how much they told me, had they told me enough for it to be a sort of 360 degree view, had they told me too much, et cetera, et cetera. I'm interested a little bit, like in that, when we're thinking about the traje trajectory of the women's lives and their erotic kind of imaginations and experiences across those lives, 
um, they all have these kind of formative experiences in the past. You know, so Lena has a rape experience. Maggie has this terrible experience of, you know, it's okay at the time, but the way it's perceived with the older man taking her virginity and the way the family reacts. And um, I guess Sloane has an interesting relationship to food. That was something that I really understood about her as a woman. And in your mind, do those formative experiences really shape what happens in, you know, when you're meeting up with the women and talking about them what's with, in terms of what's going on with them in the moment, in their adulthoods? Or are they just events that happen on the kind of trajectory of their lives and among many other events? Like how formative are those in terms of what happens next? Um, I think that everything that has come before is so formative. Like I don't think there's any part of our lives that, um, that doesn't inform the next part of our lives. But I think that from what I saw and observed that high school, that age, um, you know, junior high, when you're about, I don't know, 12 till 18, I think that that informs so much of the rest of your life, which is why what happened to Maggie at exactly that time it was such a huge stamping what happened to Lena, which, you know, there was a, a tragedy in her um, when she was younger, plus this relationship with this high school lover, Aiden, um, and Sloane, who had a similar, every, each of these women and almost all of the people I spoke to had something happen to them, either as children, but definitively there was always something in high school. I mean, I think if we look back to that time in our lives to sort of like late adolescence and on, that we, even if we can't think of something right away, if we just sit with it for a second, we're like, oh my God, like things will just come to you. Like I think as they did to me where I'm just like, oh my God, that's the reason that I'm this, you know? And so, yeah, I think that that's a really huge, I think that that time period is really big. You kind of draw that out so beautifully in the book, the the kind of the interplay between those past experiences and then what's happening for the women in their adulthoods. But the thing that also really jumped out to me was that these women really, especially Maggie and Lena potentially, really inscribed so much on these men that they were paying such acute attention to. And there's this really heartbreaking moment in Maggie's story where, which I've never forgotten and I'll never forget, where she goes to um, the teacher's house and she's paid such attention to how she looks and he comes out and he's just in a disgusting like track mm -hmm. suit and he's think yes that's you know she's she's put so much effort in it she's inscribed all of this meaning into this meeting and into him and the way that Lena kind of studies Aiden as a teenager to try and kind of become his girlfriend in the way that teenage girls do they're they're so insightful and attuned to the men and yet what your book kind of points out is that um, in, important things are also happening for them, but they're not as kind of resonant for them in the moment as the men are. So do you think that women are kind of trained or train themselves to be more thoughtful about men's desire first? Well, I, I, think, it's, I think it's still the women's desire. I just think it comes out in a way that looks like that. Mm -hmm. um, I think for one thing, there's the biology aspect that, that cannot be ignored and sucks, but it can't be ignored. Um, but the other thing I think is that um, we, uh, I speak, you know, for myself and, and most of the women that I spoke to tend to, uh, we have our desire, like what we want, but we have felt from the past, from like this sort of patriarchal hangover that we're still living in and don't know when we're going to get out from that um that that in order to have our desires met we need to sort of take care of a of a male desire in some way and it's still our desire but we sort of see the path to it in a more circuitous way and i think that's part of the way that females just you know think which is like you know not sort of blazing through the door but finding like the little sort of crannies to get around it and I think it's infinitely more interesting. Um, and I don't think it happens all the time. And I don't think it's only women and men. I don't think it's that bifurcated. But, um, but I do think that, uh, I, I don't think it's the man, really. I think the man is a stand-in um, for what the woman wants from herself 
And, you know, I think just as for men, you know, the woman is kind of incidental in a lot of orgasms, um, whether she's there or not. Uh, the man, the woman is, the man's incidental too. Like, it's just like Lena was not, like she was obsessed with Aiden, but it wasn't that she was obsessed with Aiden specifically. And I think that when she got away from it enough to sort of look at him to see that he wasn't like this amazing person, um, but an alcoholic who was cheating on his wife, uh, it, at the end of the day, it wasn't Aiden, it was Lena having sex with herself in those moments. She was reconnecting with the teenager who had essentially died at like 16 um, after a decade in a loveless, kissless relationship. And after having been group raped as a young woman, she's finally, you know, having sex with someone that she's attracted to. And mostly she's attracted to herself. So I think, I think the man is incidental, but I do think it comes out in this kind of, you know, the man in these cases, these are mostly heterosexual women, the man was the object that, that through, their, through which their desire was filtered. Wow, that's so powerfully put, thank you. Um, yeah. Natasha's asking a question. She says, alongside pleasure, there was something profoundly melancholy intertwined with the quest for seeking and satisfying desire in these stories. How do you reflect on that melancholic thread now and uh, as you were working with their narratives as well? Um, I, I, it's difficult, but, you know, I think that it, it wasn't just, I think that there's a lot of melancholy, but they were also, each of them were so very much experiencing the height of passion. And, you know, what comes with that kind of high passion is like a low pain. Um, it's just kind of, they go in tandem. It's hard to sustain one for too long without seeing the other come around eventually. Um, and, you know, and also, frankly, people who are having a sort of static, pretty decent time of it are not going to talk to someone who's asking them questions about what they were wearing when they lost their virginity. You know, so, um, so the people who were talking to me were people who were either in great pain or in great excitement over passion. So in terms of melancholy, I mean, I think we all have melancholy at different times. We're all either the, you know, victims or the heroes of our own narratives, depending even on the hour of the day. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it was melancholic, but, you know, it was also happy. Jara says that this style of deep subjectivity of the women feels like a revelation. Are there any literary moments and maybe women authors or characters that you in, that informed the way that you told the story, your artistry? Hmm. Um, you know, I mean, I, I have so many female, um, so many writers that I, uh, that I look up to and admire. I, I, you know, I mostly read fiction. So what I, the kind of fiction I like is the kind of fiction that's brutally raw and honest and that is the most, um, the most, that one has the most ability to, uh, to identify with. And so I think I just wanted to make sure that, um, I wanted to make sure that each sentence told the story of the woman in a way that was real and true to their feelings and not just kind of, you know, um, not just sort of like a David Copperfield, I was born, I was, you know, buried, etc. And because I don't really like reading nonfiction like that. So I didn't want to write nonfiction like that. I wanted to really, and I realized early on that the only way to do it, the way that I wanted to do it was to really just take the time and, and just not, like, not worry about, um, about when something was going to happen. I feel like I could talk to you for about, um, you know, a hundred more hours to pass it apart all of the different components of your book, which is so magnificent and life changing, I think, for me. One of my friends texted me last night and she was asking me to ask you a question that was also on my mind and I think is probably on the minds of all women, which is that that, that idea of this book being like a revelation, which is sort of um, really powerful, but also kind of sad because, you know, I'm 38 years old and reading a book about women's desire was, yeah, revelatory to me instead of being <laughs> something that it should be so deeply felt and known. I was like, yes, yes. Why has nobody ever said this to me before? This is really shocking, but I'm so glad that it, it exists in the world, Lisa. 
But um, my friend wanted to know, and, and I do too, whether men have found it a revelatory experience and whether they've conveyed that to you if they've read the book. Well, the seven men who have read the book have <laughs> quite enjoyed it. Um, yeah, no, you know, actually the first, one of the first male readers of the book said to me that until he had read it, he did not realize how indifference could be so wounding. And that made me so happy because it's something that for all of the people that I spoke to, but specifically for Lena, which is where he sort of got that feeling from, I was just like, yeah, that's exactly, I am so happy that that was what you got. Um, and I've had a, a number of men, it's, it's interesting because like whenever people have talked to me or interviewed me, it's very rarely men. And I think it's because men are like, eeks, I don't, I don't want to say the wrong thing. It's, ah, <laughs> I don't know what to say. Um, but I love it when talking to men because they have such interesting ways of, of coming to it and how they feel about it. And it's so different from women and it's, um, it's a lot, it's very open in fact. I've never had a man, with the exception of one man who um, stood up at a reading I gave in Washington DC and said, why was the woman that he was with not having orgasms? And that was, you know, so beyond him, that was his question for me, like I had the answer to that. Uh, <laughs> so other than that, every man that I've spoken to has been really, really interesting. Oh, that's so wonderful to hear. Well, I hope every man in the land reads this book and, <laughs> and women too, because it's amazing. It's been so yeah. wonderful talking to you, Lisa. Thank you so yeah. much for doing this work. We, Thank you. Really Thank you. This has been lovely. Thank you. And, and to you, darling Alice, thank you so much for actually having this extraordinary conversation with, with you, Lisa. Lisa, I wanted to hold up your book too, but I've passed it on to one of my girlfriends. Uh, I think it's that type of book. It's a little bit like one of those books that's going to go around and by the time you've got a copy, it's going to be well-worn, you know, the, the, there'll be pages bent and covers that have been ruined with coffee cups and wine glass marks. <laughs> but my suggestion to each and every one of you, of course, is to go immediately to the Readings website and purchase a brand new copy, if not for yourself, certainly for someone who needs to read more about women's sexuality and how goddamn good we are. <laughs> uh, to you, Alice, to you, Lisa, what an extraordinary treat to spend Wednesday morning with you. Can we do it again next week or is that too much? <laughs> you are <laughs> such a treat. To all of you that came today, thank you so, so much. I look forward to seeing you soon. Take care out there. Lots and lots of love. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Alice. Bye. Bye, all. Thank you for coming. <laughs>